there have been uh, extraordinary times uh, in my Christian life where I've been extraordinarily blessed at when by the church operating just as we hear uh, uh, here on, in scripture this morning where uh, no one held anything for themselves and they cared for those uh, in need. I remember uh, as a certain church we were part of for many years, uh, there were lots of young families uh, and the, the sort of baby and um, toddler and young children equipment and clothing just sort of flowed through the church from one generation to another. Uh, once, uh, you know, once it, one family had finished using it, it went to another family uh, and then to another family. And it was a, a beautiful thing uh, to watch. Uh, and when people started to bring uh, meals, when people weren't well, or uh, there was a new baby in the house, and for ourselves, I remember one Christmas, uh, our, um, one of the children had recently been born, uh, and someone made sure that Christmas was in a packet ready for us. It was the easiest Christmas from a food perspective uh, that we had ever had, and it was such a blessing because people had made it, and therefore uh, we didn't have to focus too much uh, on it. I know where people have opened their homes to allow, say, young uh, men and women to come and stay uh, because they're exploring jobs or they've come to a different uh, part of um, uh, the country. We've got friends, actually, at the moment who have taken in uh, Ukrainian refugees and they've been living with them. Uh, for a number of t uh, times, we in the past have had single people live with us so that it was a time where they could live amongst uh, a family and experience something very different. Those are wonderful testimonies, and we see it amongst us of the church working as the church was designed to be. But in our reading this morning, we've got two really contrasting events, haven't we? We've got uh, one, the, the church sharing everything, that uh, there is no needy person, we are told. And we're given one example uh, of what that actually looks like. This man, Joseph, obviously a rich man because he owns land, otherwise known as Barnabas. And he sold a field that he owned and brought the money and put it at the feet of the apostles so that it could be used for those who were in need. And then we read in complete contrast about another rich couple, Ananias and Sapphira, who sell a field but withhold some of those proceeds, who lie to the disciples and as a result both fall down dead in judgment for their wrongdoing. It's a wildly sobering an account. But before we delve into each of those different uh, approaches and stories, I think it's worth noting the significance that we are actually reading about Ananias and Sapphira. Because it displays extraordinary honesty of the author of the gospel, or not, the, the author of the book of Acts. We know Luke wrote the book of Acts. He obviously wrote the book of the Gospel of Luke. And right at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, I'm sure many of you will remember, he writes this, I've carefully investigated everything and spoken to eyewitnesses so that you, the reader, may be certain of these things. Luke is a historian. He has gone off searching out the stories uh, and the history. And therefore, he can't just pick and choose and only just record the good stuff. And I think it's a testimony of the honesty of Scripture, the authenticity and the integrity of Scripture that Luke has put Barnabas on one hand, but also is prepared to to record the uncomfortable reality of what happened with Ananias and Sapphira. 
And that should give us confidence. Confidence in Christ, confidence in the Bible, and confidence in the gospel that we know. So what of the community of sharing that we're teaching into this morning? Up until now, the book of Acts has focused, I cautiously use the phrase, but on the spiritual characteristics of the new church. Gathering and prayer, worship, teaching, the miraculous healing, signs and wonders. And of course, we spoke uh, in recent weeks about the confrontations between uh, the church and the religious leaders. And our passage this morning begins in the same vein. All the believers were of one heart and mind. This speaks of deep fellowship and togetherness. And I have to say my hope is that we as a body here would be uh, believers of one mind and one heart. Not necessarily agreeing about everything because we're different, but we would be for each other and desiring the best for each other and a flourishing community. But then it gets into the practical. We read that no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything that they had. Why? In verse 34, they worked so that there was no needy person among them. And so we are then given that example, that practical example. We read about the man Joseph, also known as Barnabas, who was clearly a man of means, who sold some property, a field, and gave the money to the apostles. We've got a, slight, a, a distinct shift of emphasis from where it's been about the sort of spiritual uh, shape and ministry of the church, as I say, the worship and, and prayer and the witness of Jesus, into perhaps the mundane realities of practical everyday life and care for the church itself. This is about the care from within the body of uh, the church which equally is important as the outward. Luke is recording effectively love in action. You'll be familiar, I'm sure, some of you, of um, St. Francis of Assisi. He was um, an Italian who founded the Franciscan Order of, of Monks. And this was around sort of uh, 1181, uh, I think he died in 1226. Uh, but he is famously as quoted as this, and I'm sure you will have heard this, preach the gospel always, and if necessary, use words. Preach the gospel always, and if necessary, use words. I.e., the, the gospel is a gospel of action and of um, caring for one another. It's what we do as much as what we say. In fact, perhaps it's more of what we do and behave rather than what we say. The good news of God is practical. As part of believers, or as believers, part of our call is to ensure that the needs of the people around us, and particularly within the church itself, are cared for. And there are three things that I think that we pluck out of uh, this example of Barnabas, but also what is called for at, uh, in this passage. Firstly, is a radical attitude to our stuff. Verse 32, no one claimed that their possessions were their own. Do you hold on to your possessions? Are they yours or are they God's? Where do they come from? Now, this is not about renouncing private property. This isn't, because I was having some banter with a member of our congregation who was preparing for this week, this isn't about Christian co uh, communism. <laughs> this is all about attitude of heart. Stuff is just stuff. Things are just things. And in the context of the kingdom of God, they are just peripheral stuff they're not important in terms of eternity there isn't here 
as the, old, the original church didn't claim their own things. There isn't a sort of, this is mine and I'm going to hold on. Who's, who's Lord of the Rings fans? Lord of the Rings movies, one or two, not as many as I'd like. Well, a character, there's one character in there called Gollum, and he's obsessed by the ring. Precious. You know, and he's just overwhelmed because he wants, the, 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 he wants to hold on to the ring. He won't let go. And, of course, it just turns him into a monster as a result. Where do we turn into a monster because it's mine and I won't let go? We're called to just hold everything lightly. And if someone else needs something and we don't need it to release it. We're talking about swish parties here. <laughs> we're talking about letting go. Do you really need that dress or that blouse or that pair of trousers? Can we let it go and bless someone else with it? So we need a real rad radical attitude to our belongings and our stuff. The secondly is then there's a sacrificial action. Barnabas sold a belonging. He sold his, his field. That's a really big, significant step. Will we be people who are prepared to make sacrifices in our own lives to be able to bless others? That doesn't mean that we're left needy and we destitute ourselves, but it does mean, well, do I really need that? But look, someone else really does, and freely give. Will we be, have a radical attitude to our stuff? Secondly, will we then respond with sacrificial action? And then thirdly, which I think we do sometimes need to hear, the response is to need. It isn't a response out of obligation or woe me or I mustn't have and therefore I must give away, give away. That's great, but it is not the call. The call is, do you see a need and then do you respond to it? This is, we are not setting a model, and this doesn't set a model of church about all of us being totally equal, denying ourselves of the good things of life, all the benefits and the fruits of our own labors. But what it is doing is about being alert to the need of the other, which comes from a place of compassion and of love and attentiveness to those around us. We will always be filled as a body of, with a breadth and a variety of people, of financial means and of social circumstances, etc. We'll all be different. But the question is whether we spot the other person's need and support them. What's our heart attitude? Will we help others? What we witness here is a sense of responsibility towards one another due to a deep care to one another rather than just caring for myself. And the other thing is that there's no legal obligation here. We're not talking about law. We're not talking about I've got to. How much? What does the Bible... It's about generosity of heart and care for the others. That's the New Testament attitude towards giving and our stuff. 2 Corinthians, uh, the letter to the ch church in Corinth by Paul. He says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or not under compulsion, obligation, legality, for God loves a cheerful giver. You'll be enriched when you give as a cheerful giver. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And I want to be very clear, let's not restrict this to money and finances. This needs to come in every form of, of it could be about how we um, give our time. It could be about our relationship and companionship. It could be about our gifts. It could be about giving away furniture or cooking meals or helping others in the garden or helping with people with their computer or um, being transport for somebody else. This is not all about money or, or possessions. It's about ourselves giving generously to others. Um, this last week, uh, there were three of us who, um, one person in, in the church has a neighbor who uh, has... Um, their life is sort of um, uh, um, 
it's a challenging life and confused life and, and a difficult life, uh, but they're d trying to do some things about it. Uh, and th three of us went round to help that person um, start to clear out their house. Uh, they are hoarders of the worst kind that you might have uh, been, uh, uh, have some context with. Uh, and we had a skip and we did one room. But we were able to go in love and action. They're not believers, uh, but they are neighbors. And we went round and... So what I mean by this generous giving uh, of ourselves, uh, it's not just about money, it's about our time. And there are many other ways. But that was the love in action. And it was a real privilege to be invited not only into that person's house and the bravery of that person of what they're trying to do, but also as team to go and to share and help clear that person's house out. What is the attitude of our heart? and our mind in terms of our belongings, our money, our gifts, our time. I know I can be really protective over some of those things in my own life. What do we hold on to rather than let go? Are we open to selling a possession like Barnabas did to enable blessing of someone else? And let me very clear, because I, I want to be really clear that we don't hear the wrong message here through our own filters. There is no condemnation here. St. Barnabas' testimony of you so far is that you're incredibly generous. But this is about doing an audit and learning. What's the state of our hearts? I see what I see because it's visible. But what's going on in the inner places of our heart and the dark places? You will know that. And of course, here we come to another set of the story, a contrasting story, because the Lord knows what's in the heart of Ananias and Sapphira. So what about them? This is a bit more sobering, isn't it? We have this amazing picture of this caring and compassionate church, and St. Barnabas as an example, and hooray. And then we read this, very, very different and when we read this, one of the things that strikes us that we must pick out is that let's remember it's not all rosy in the early church. Even then, there are people in the body of, uh, of believers that aren't all got it together. And the church is full of imperfect people then as they are filled with imperfect people uh, now. Put your hands up if you equate to that. The Satan is also the enemy, is at work and is trying to be disruptive. And he was at work here in Sophia's and Ananias' life. Which page am I on? What does, um, yeah, so the enemy is seriously at, at, at work. So what can we learn about what's going on here? The first thing that we need to establish is that the problem here, and we must really understand this, the problem here is not that Ananias kept some of his money back. Okay? That is not fundamentally the issue. Peter points this out and is very clear. He, Peter says to Ananias, didn't the land belong to you before you sold it? And after you sold it, Weren't the proceeds yours too? So he's saying, is it yours? It's totally yours. So you can do what you want with it. The point, however, is that the land, the money, it was theirs, and therefore they can do whatever they want. But what we read is that he kept back part of the money for himself. And that is the root of the problem it's the kept back, because the kept back implies that the original intention was to sell and give it to the church or to the apostles. But for whatever reason, there was then that moment where he kept back some of the money. The kept back tells us that he was withholding something that was originally intended to be given. And that's the problem. Ananias, right at the beginning, if he was led by the Lord or however it was worked, could have quite happily sold half the, you know, sold the, 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 um, the field, given half to the church and half to him, himself. That could have been the plan. But there is something in here 
about the being kept back. That phrase tells us that the original plan, there was something that went wrong in their motives. And so what births out of an act of withholding? We witness deceit and dishonesty, lies, and ultimately judgment, which ends up in death. What does scripture tell us about the purpose of Satan, the enemy? John 10.10. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That is the nature and the language of the enemy. What do we see right at the heart of this story? We see a stealing from the church, the destroying of trust and fellowship within the church, and as a result, death comes to Ananias and Sapphira. This is sobering for us. I said earlier, I've witnessed great care and generosity amongst us, but we also need to be alert that we don't withhold where the Lord has otherwise also asked us to give. This morning is a reminder and an invitation to audit our hearts, to check that we aren't being in any way like Ananias and Sapphira. We don't want to withhold where the Lord is calling us to do something else. And there could be all sorts of reasons why that could have sudden fear. I, I've been there. Emma and I could, you know, we can both sit there and think, you know, of, of times where we've, uh, yep, we're going to do that. And then there's that being discussion. I certainly know it's been in my heart um, where over the years, do I, you know, or did, did the Lord really say that and start to withhold? I absolutely know it in my life. And often it'll come out of fear or because of what will that mean for me or, or will that leave us enough or, or whatever it may be, or have I got the energy, etc. It's a reminder to us to be alert, that we give to give with right motives, that we don't withhold and we give freely and generously as St. Paul commands us to do in his letter to Corinth. Again, let's not resist this being about money only. Don't hear this just about money. But it's all about how we offer ourselves in our time, in our gifts. Is the Lord asking you to serve somebody or something or the church in some way, but you've been holding back? Maybe that is an area. Or maybe you're just right where, where the Lord is. This is about doing a check and doing an audit with the Lord. So let me come into land before we respond the church, we are called to be radical, radically uh, a sharing community in order that no one within the community is in need. And of course, no, we've got to know the other person's need, which means we've got to know each other, isn't it? Which also means that we sometimes need to express our own need, which we're not very good at, is it? Being very British. But sometimes, do we need to put our ha hand up and say, actually, help? And that could be a practical thing, or it could be an emotional thing, or it could be spiritual, or it could be whatever. Do we also need to be courageous enough to ask for help? The invitation this morning about being a sharing community or a community who shares is will we have a radical attitude to our stuff and our belongings, our time and ourselves? And with that, will we then sacrificially act in response to the need around us? And then be alert to that we are responding to the need. Because there is a possibility that Ananias said, oh, I'll just gain some status and impress everybody by selling my field and then giving money and being visibly, you know, impressed. What was his attitude? But will we be an attitude of praying and caring and be radical about our stuff and not hoard and not sit there going, pressure? But please hear that this is an audit. Where are you in your heart? Where are you in the journey uh, about caring and, 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 and sharing with those around us uh, and around you? So let us respond to that. Let us think, how does the Lord want to stir you? Why don't you, for a moment, in a moment, the band are going to come up and...